one. And then we're going to read uh, a couple of different places in chapter 2. James chapter 1 verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Yeah. Chapter 2, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings, fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, you say to him, you sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brother, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you to courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you will do well. And then I want to read, uh, let me see, uh, verse 15. If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So, you probably notice in the reading of the scriptures, there's one word that occurs repeatedly, and it's the word poor. So, in this class, I want to talk about James and the poor. We used to have a downtown church. I pastored downtown full gospel for 33 years. And often there were people ringing the doorbell and asking for money. I always had a really hard time to know what to do. Because I knew for some of them, if I gave them money, they would, they would make tracks to the closest liquor store and get drunk. And I thought that's not a good way to spend the Lord's money. And yet I had compassion on them. And I'm thinking, I'm wondering... You know, what is the right thing to do? So, I decided I would go to the Bible and try to figure it out. I don't know why it took me so long to make that decision. But when I went to the Bible and began to study the whole subject of the poor, I discovered that, that there are two main types of poor described in the Bible. If you want to write them down here, the first is those who are poor by choice. Many people are poor because they have made wrong choices. Either they chose not to work, or they chose to spend the money in improper ways. When the Bible talks about the poor, and our response to them is not talking about these people. Proverbs 6, 10 to 11, you just want to jot the verse down, says a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall your poverty come. Proverbs what? Proverbs 6, 10 to 11. The Bible absolutely <coughs> condemns laziness. The first commandment God gave to Adam was look after the garden, get to work. Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10, and I think if 
If our culture would follow this and our government would follow this, it would save us a lot of trouble. But Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians 3.10, he said, For even when we were with you, we commanded you that if anyone will not work, he should not eat. Now, if he cannot work, that's a totally different issue. If he will not work, that's another subject. So when the Bible talks about my attitude toward the poor, it's not talking about those who simply don't, don't want to work. I think uh, our culture could solve a lot of problems if we just said, when you get hungry, you'll find a job. Now, I know there's lots of issues, and I understand that, but I, I just want to say that when the Bible talks about the poor, it defines those, number one, who are poor by choice. Second, it describes those who are poor by circumstance. Many of the people in the world are poor and it's no fault of their own. Absolutely no fault at all. Can be sickness, can be natural disasters, can be the death of a parent or a spouse, can be unfair employers, and it can be oppressive governments. I've been in 50 countries of the world. I have seen poverty at its very worst. And often, it is a result of oppressive governments. So Isaiah chapter 3, verse 15, when the prophet is rebuking the nation of Israel, Isaiah 3, 15, he said, what do you rulers mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor? James 5 and 4 says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which, kept, which you kept by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. In many countries of the world, the poor people are incredibly oppressed. I've spent the last eight years working in Cambodia, where the average person earns a dollar a day. And the poverty is unbelievable. And a lot of it is the oppression of the leaders, their own leaders in their own nation. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 5, God said, I will be a swift witness against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans and turn away the refugee. So let me boil it down just really simple, as I understand it. When the Bible talks about the poor, it's talking about the orphan, it's talking about the widow. It's talking about the underpaid servant. It's talking about the refugee. And it's talking about the slave. And if we get time at the end of the teaching, I want to talk to you about human trafficking. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about the poor. So, come back to James, chapter 1, verse 27. He said, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit the orphans and the widows in their troubles. I discovered when I began to search the Bible about this, that God has a special heart for the orphan and for the widow. And, and when we think about the widow, I don't want us to think so much about a widow in the context of Canada, because, because mostly our widows are cared for in this culture. But I'm talking about most of the world, where the widows and the orphans face incredible poverty, and God cares. 
So here's some scriptures. You want to write them down. Psalm 68 verse 5 says that God is a father to the fatherless and he is a defender of the widows. That's God's heart. So it's really simple in lots of ways. If it's God's heart, it should be my heart. Yes. If God cares, I should care. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28 and 29. Again, if you just kind of want to put that verse down, then I'll read it and you can listen to it. Deuteronomy 14, verse 28 and 29. God said at the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite and the stranger, that's the refugee, and the fatherless and the widows who are within your gates, they come and eat and be satisfied that, that, the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands, which you do. God has promised a blessing if we care for the poor. Now turn to Isaiah because I want you to see this. Isaiah chapter 1. The underline your Bible, there's some key words here I want you to see. Isaiah chapter 1. And verse 17 says, Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have your Bible open and you're looking, you will discover that those are action words. And later in this chapter, James said, if you just believe and don't do anything, you're falling short. That true faith manifests itself in godly action. So, here in Isaiah, it's learn to do good. You have to learn that because it doesn't come natural. And seek justice. You've got to go after it. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. So in other words, God's saying, we need to take action, do something about the poor of the world. So let's go back to James chapter 2. And uh, the story opens, the chapter opens, James told the story. And he talked about two men who came to church. One is obviously a rich man. He has got expensive clothes on. He's got gold rings on his finger. This guy looks like money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Along with them, there comes a beggar. This guy has got poor clothes, probably doesn't smell good, and he doesn't look very good. And so the usher meets these two people at the door. So the rich man, he's said, well, welcome to church. I've just got the seat for you. And he takes him and gives him a seat right at the front. But the beggar, the usher doesn't want to walk him down the aisle and put him on the front seat. So he's saying to the poor guy, there's a little spot over here in the corner. You sit over there. So James said there's a problem, there's a really big problem when we treat the rich one way and treat the poor another way. So there's six things that he gives here. You want to write them down? Uh, that will help you. Number one, he said that genuine faith shows no partiality. James chapter 2, verse 1, he said, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. In other words, he said, we need to be treat everybody equal. Because he, if we judge a person's value, on what they look like on the outside, 
we're wrong. And so James went on to say in, in verse 4, he said, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and you have become judges? What happens is, if a rich man comes in and a poor man comes in and I treat them different, I have set myself up as a judge. I said, this guy's important, this guy's unimportant. I have become a judge. But Romans 14.4 asks the question, who are you to judge another man's servant? Only the Lord is the judge. And that's why God said a long time ago to Samuel, the Lord looks on the heart, not the outside. Mm -hmm. So the second thing that James said here is that faith is true riches. Verse 5, has not God chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? What is the true measure of importance or value? Some people say it's money, but the Bible says it's faith. Some of the poorest people I have met in the world have been the richest. I've been in 50 countries of the world in my life, made 40 mission trips. I have met precious brothers who had nothing except what they were wearing. Nothing. I met a pastor, didn't have a Bible. He's a pastor. He didn't have a Bible. He couldn't afford a Bible. I gave him mine. But I've never met anybody so happy, so peaceful, so joyful. He was actually a refugee, had been driven out of one of the cupboards in Africa to the other one. I forget which way it went. But I thought about this man, I thought about my big house back home and my car, you know, a little bit of money in the bank. And I'm sitting down with this black brother and I know deep in my heart this guy is richer than I am. And it put a whole different face for me on what's really important. I've been in India in homes of the Christians. There are no clothes hanging because all they have, they're wearing. There's nothing in the pantry except a little tiny bowl of rice. There's nothing else. In the house, they sleep on the floor. And I was preaching about heaven one day, and I said, in heaven, you won't hunger anymore or thirst. And they started to weep. And then they raised their hands to heaven and started to praise the Lord because they thought about a place where they'd never be hungry again. And again, I thought to myself, these people have something that I need. So James said some of the, the true riches is faith. Third thing he said, and I can't develop these now, but he said the rich often oppress the poor, verse 6 and 7. You read the history of the church. It's been the rich and the powerful that have oppressed the poor. The believers. Number four, he said the believer is governed by the royal law. He said in verse eight, if you really fulfill the royal law, somebody said, well, one day, what's the royal law? It's the law given by the king, by God. You should love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to jot down a couple of extra verses, then we haven't got time to go to now. But Romans 13, 9 and 10. Romans 13, 9 and 10, Matthew 22, 39. Each of those verses talk about 
the royal commandment, and the royal commandment is that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Number five, James said, to show, to show partiality is sin. James 2 and 9, if you show partiality, you commit sin. Really simple. So I was a pastor for 60 years. And I know the temptation to show partiality. It's there without a question. To think in your heart, well, this person's really valuable, but this person, you know, if they came or left, it wouldn't matter. But James said, that's sin. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but it's true. That's what he said. It's sin. And the sixth thing that he said is we will face a final judgment. James 2 and 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Romans 14, 10 says we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I often told my church there are two days that are important. There's this day and that day. This day is the day I have. That day is the day when I will appear before the Lord. I've learned as much as possible to live my life each day in the light of that day when I will stand before the Lord. Amen. So let's go back here to James chapter 2. I don't want to just kind of pull this together and give you a bunch of scriptures. I want us to look at verse 15 and 16. Because James now takes these principles and makes them reality. He said, if a brother or sister, and I think that's really important, is naked and destitute of daily food, so this brother or sister need is real. And you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? And I think to put it into sort of today's language, that somebody in the, in the church, a brother or sister, has a legitimate need, and they come to you. The temptation is to say, well, I'll pray for you. And prayer is good, but sometimes prayer is a cop -out. So he said, just don't say, God bless you, he'll look after you, and leave them. He said, no, you, if you have the capacity to meet their need, then that's your obligation. Do it. First John 3 and 17 says, but whoever, so that's all of us, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and again, this is legitimate need, and shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? That's the question. Now, that's so, brother. so does this mean church only? Or does this mean any, me? It says brother or sister. Does that mean church only or anyone in the world? I believe that first and foremost we have a responsibility in the church to our to our family, let's say. But I believe it doesn't stop there. Obviously, we cannot meet the needs of everybody in the entire world. We cannot. But I've always said this when people say, well, you know, what difference do you think you can make? I tell them, it'll be different for the one I feed. For sure. I read a story of a little boy who was going along the beach and the waves had tossed all the starfish up on the beach. There's thousands of them. The little boys go along picking them up and throwing them down. 
And the man came along and said, uh, what difference do you think it makes what you're doing? He said it made a big difference to the one I threw back in. <laughs> so we cannot help them all, but the way I've lived my life is, I've said I can't help everybody, but I can't help somebody. So there's a lot of scriptures. Uh, let's read a bunch. Uh, what time is it going? How much time do we have left? 7.38. Pardon me? It's 7.38. So we got almost time. Eight minutes. Eight minutes? Eight. Okay, let's read it really quick. Let's go to Deuteronomy. One eight. Oh, okay. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Verse 7 and 8 and 10. Deuteronomy 15, verse 7 to 8 and 10. says, If there is a poor man of your brethren, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him. You shall surely give to him, and here's the clincher, and your heart should not be grieved when you give it to him. <laughs> so God is really crystal clear about it. If a brother is in need, and that need is legitimate, and he comes to us, and we have the ability or the capacity to meet that need, it's a divine obligation. Now I want to take you to Isaiah 58. Isaiah chapter 58, several years ago, rearranged my life in terms of the poor. And I begin to read Isaiah chapter 58. It's about the fast. And let me say before I read it, I believe in fasting. I've done two 40-day fasts, several 21-day fasts, 10 days and 3 days. I believe in fasting. But here's something in Isaiah chapter 57. Let me read from, uh, from verse 5. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen? You underline your Bibles, this is one of the key verses, I believe, when it talks about the poor. Here is the fast I have chosen. Number one, to loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. I believe that's particularly talking about the people who are slaves. Verse 7, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Now look at verse 8. If you mark your Bibles, mark the first word, dead. Dead. If you do that, then your light will break forth like the morning, and your healing shall bring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then, then you shall call, and the Lord will answer, you shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your lips. Mm -hmm. That passage of scripture just rearranged my life. Mm -hmm. 
And I begin to understand to some degree God's heart for the poor. Mm -hmm. So, in the early church, if you want to write down a couple of verses, and we won't go there because I want to go to one of the really important verses. But Acts 2.45 said they divided to those who had need. And you know all that story. In Galatians 2 and 10, when they had the big conference about the grace of God and the future of the church, the decision was made that we, we should remember the poor. And a great deal of Paul's ministry on his last missionary journey had to do with the poor. Now, I want to take in Matthew 25, and then be the end of our teaching, and I want to share something with you that if we have questions, we can entertain. You know, it's strange how different parts of the Bible grab your spirit. It's about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, when, when the Holy Spirit really laid hold of me about the poor. And, and part of the thing that gripped me was this passage in Matthew 25, if you want to turn there. Matthew chapter 25. And I want to read from verse 34. This has to do with the, with the judgment. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now notice this. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Just notice the, the people, hungry, thirsty, stranger. Verse 36, I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Now notice these, this last verse, and the king will answer, and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it, the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Mm -hmm. And the least of these are the poor, the hungry, the naked, the prisoner, and the refugee. So, let me share my heart with you as we wrap it up. I want to talk to you about uh, slavery in our world. Probably most of you are aware, but you might not be. Because 10 years ago, I was totally oblivious. There are between 30 and 40 million slaves in the world today. There's more people slaves today than at any time in human history. It's hard to believe. 80% of the slaves in the world are females. What? 80%? 80% are female. 50% are children. You think about that. 50%, 15 to 20 million children. You'll find them in fields, in factories. You'll find them any place and every place. But we will, you will find most of the females in sexual slavery. 
I've done a great deal of research in this and discovered that the average age of the female in the brothels of the world is 13 years of age. I didn't say the I didn't say the youngest, I said the average. So eight years ago the Lord began to speak to me. When I finished downtown at the church, the Lord said to me it was a brand new chapter that'll have to do with the with rescuing the slave girls in the world. And we began to work with uh, a Cambodian pastor in the rescue of these precious, beautiful girls from the brothels. All I can say is that over the years, hundreds of precious young girls have been rescued. They're brought to a safe house, given medical treatment, but most of all, they're told about Jesus. They're told about a man who loves them but won't take anything from them. About a man who will love them unconditionally but will never abuse them, and never use them. And I've watched those precious girls as their hearts open to Jesus. And I see them as they stand in the church, raise their hands to heaven, and to begin to give thanks to the Lord. Because they've been delivered not only out of hell in the future, but they've been delivered out of hell in this life. We teach them a trade, they learn to sew, and how to do computer work, and we teach them all kinds of skills so that at the end of the year, if they're old enough, they, they have a way to make a living. And if they're young, we put them in a Christian family where they're loved and cared for, and they stay there until we get them a nice husband who loves Jesus. And every time I see them and look at them, I hear the words of Jesus as you did it to them. You did it to me. Amen. So I don't know what your world's like or, or where you fit in that whole scheme. All I wanted to convey in this lesson is that God is a heart for the poor. And I should be like him and care for the poor too. How you, how you flesh that out can be totally different than how we fleshed it out. Anyway, let's, uh, I don't know if, what the time is. It's terrible when I don't wear the watch. <laughs> there are two statistics of Calgary Bar is that there are 2,000 women in the city. You are absolutely right. There, uh, to think that slavery is only in Cambodia or other places. It's here, it's in our city, it's in our nation. Uh, for instance, you know, there's some big football games coming up in the States, or maybe they've already played, because I, I don't know what time to watch. But what I know is, when they play the Super Bowl and those kinds of things, they will bring in 10 to 15,000 slave girls as prostitutes for that weekend of football. It's, it's a well-established fact. It's, it's not something that I got off YouTube. It's a well-established fact. The, the authorities know about it, but there's too much money to be made to deal with that. And there is all kinds of slavery it is most rapid, without a doubt, in Asia, India, and many other parts of the world. Um, yeah. Okay.
Okay. They bring in thousands of the stampede week. Yeah. No, it's really true. It's, uh, so, you know, that's only one slice of the pool. And, uh, but James had some really pointed things to say about the poor. Okay. So I was, uh, I was kind of preaching, not teaching, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is there time left? Okay. Thank you. Take a break and then we'll... Next question we're going to talk about is Tom. Chapter 3. One thing I thought about James is he, he didn't ever go to public education school. He's kind of lazy and straight up. <laughs> so we'll take a little break and we'll come back for the later. I will not be here for the second class.